Byron Williams and we're back with the small print and today our guest is Brett Thompson. So Brett, I'm going to let you introduce yourself the way you would like to be introduced. Thanks, Byron. Uh, I'm Brett Thompson. I am the CEO and co-founder of Mzanzi Meat, which is Africa's first cultivated meat company and also the co-creator of this show, well, Discourse ZA, not, uh, not the small print. But so, yeah, wonderful to be on your show. Absolutely. So can you actually start with telling us a bit more about yourself and how you ended up in this role? Because I do think that your journey has been quite interesting. I would love for you to share it rather than coming across in my words. Sure thing. Um, I, I um, about 10, 15 years ago, I won't go in that much detail, don't worry. But um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I just stopped eating meat after a couple of lectures from David Benetton, who is a UCT uh, philosopher and professor at, at UCT and just through that sort of asking questions about my own diet and found it interesting and a lot of the time a lot of people were asking questions about my diet and I found myself doing a lot of research on the reasons for not eating meat whether it's health environment animal ethics or you name it and I just became more and more um, just interested in the topic of food systems and the role that also like alternatives and food and, and solutions do play in, in kind of changing the way that we eat. And sort of fast forward, I, I wrote my thesis on this at Stellenbosch when I uh, finished up there was, I ended up dropping out my master's because I got a job. Um, so I decided to go get a job working for a company called Fry's, which is uh, South Africa's largest production, uh, producer of um, meat alternatives. And they also produce for a lot of country, uh, countries around the world. And then through that, spent some time in Germany working with nonprofits, also all working in the psychology as well of um, understanding food choices to try and um, make ones that are probably more, more uh, sustainable, let's say, or more ethical. And eventually came back to South Africa, didn't really know what to do, and decided to start my own nonprofit um, in animal advocacy. And the next thing that led to us saying, well, look, there's no one doing cultivated meat in Africa. Um, Saturday Agriculture was a, a non-entity here about a year or so ago, and, and we started the first the first um, Saturday Agriculture company, and the rest is kind of history. But uh, and now we're trying to make we're trying to make some beef burgers. Fantastic. So can you actually break down the difference between like what Fry's was doing mm -hmm. and cellular agriculture? So I know this, but it would definitely be more profound coming from yourself. Can you describe the difference between yeah. faux food and <laughs> cellular agriculture? What are we actually talking about here? Well, well I think that's a uh, faux food is a good way to like sort of start the conversation. Um, I think um, <clears throat> there's sort of your, your, your fries, your, your meat alternatives. Um, they're made generally from wheat and soy. Uh, protein. Vegetables pertaining to be meat. Exactly. Yeah, you know, they've they've <laughs> got a lot, a lot of they they are imposter syndrome and they and they um they dress up in certain um uh, I don't know uh, blanket uh, you put it I don't know what is it a hot dog in a blanket or something and then see what it does but um no the so it's so that's your your sort of original in the like last 30, 40 years uh, there's a number of these there's corn which is the the mushroom based one there is um a couple of uh, uh, light life and and etc from the states and tempeh and seitan and all these things, which are proteins that they are sort of mimicking the taste of meat. Then roughly about five years ago, um, uh, a couple of companies came out, maybe even longer, um, such as Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. And they're, they're probably described as your novel 2.0 uh, meat alternative uh, product. They, you know, they use soy as well, but also pea extract, which has become quite popular within this, within this space. And they're really kind of, you know, they, they got the taste profile a lot closer to what a meat eater was going to be eating. And particularly, they were looking to target meat eaters, not vegans and vegetarians. And I think so that they're was more convincing part. fakes. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they're just yeah, better politicians. Um, but uh, so they you know they um, they just were able to uh, you know really get closer. A lot more science came behind us. Uh, Pat Brown from Impossible Foods. He's from Stanford University. Um, I've actually been to their lab. Uh, well, you know, it is their lab in, 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 uh, in the Bay Area, and it is phenomenally, it's just big, firstly. I mean, you just can't believe how much science is around um, a couple of veggie burgers. Um, and so they, they really took it to the next level. And then, um, and then after that, Beyond Meat IPO'd, and um, there's a, a lot of stuff happened within the space. A lot of money ran into it. So the, the, I call it 2.0, and I think a lot of other people do, the sort of next generation uh, meat alternatives. But it still is a meat alternative. 
So it's taking plants, as you say, it's taking existing proteins and then trying to, um, uh, or plant proteins and trying to make them taste closer to meat. Um, and I think there's probably a couple of things that we can unpack hopefully in, later on in, in, in how I don't think, I think there's a limit to which consumers will accept something like that. Because it's still, if meat is the end goal, people will always still see it as a less than. So, yeah, my, my um, question is, as a marketer, is who are you actually trying to appeal to exactly. with a with a fake sausage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if you are a vegetarian for ethical reasons or a vegan for ethical reasons, you don't actually want the sausage on your plate to resemble a meat product. So that's already mm -hmm. a question for me from a marketing mm -hmm. perspective. And if you are a red-blooded South African meat eater, which is one of the few things that like all cultures in South Africa have in common is a mm -hmm. love for mm -hmm. the bride, <laughs> mm -hmm. then you're not going to be very convinced by mushrooms in the shape of a sausage, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, so you're kind of alienating both target markets, which for me has always been a bit of an issue. I mean, if you're going to get people to switch to a vegan or a vegetarian diet, they must be doing it for the right reasons. And there's only mm. so long that you can sort of trick people. There's only mm. so many times you can ser serve your dad's soy mince before he catches on, right? I mean, I remember my mother trying to do this to my father in like the 80s and 90s. It didn't go well, <laughs> you know? So I think, that, I think that there is definitely an opportunity to proceed this conversation forward into the future and where technology mm. comes in which is where your products and services come in which is approaching this beast for want of a better word from a very different way it's almost a way to mm. give us our so we can have our cow and and eat it too right mm. yeah i mean i think i had that one written down i wanted to say that line but you got it first <laughs> i um i look i think so you, you you're, you're, you're tapping all the right things so what what um um what a lot of companies in this space now would argue and what would say, I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, alternative meat companies, uh, uh, plant milk companies, and there's egg, or there's, or the whole range of, of them, is that they are approaching and they wanted to target what would be described as a flexitarian. As somebody which, I, are the namings of these things really do get to me, vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian, it, like, omni, like it just... Firstly, it adds labels, more labels. So it's labels. more labels, which we do not. <laughs> Last thing uh, we need is more identity yeah. politics. We don't want it's, that. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the identity within food is is possibly an under, I mean, I was going to say undercooked, but it is under, under <laughs> like, at least spoken about. I mean, it, it's as bad, it's, it's as pervasive. Very it's tribal. As divisive. Yeah, it's tribal. And I like the way that, I like what you mentioned about how the braai or the shishinyama or the poiki or the, the fire brings people to get together and i think that's something that we identified as mzanzi is that we want to focus on that and how do we how do we it's not about solving the problem but how do we get how do we uh, how do we get into that you know how do we get into that poiki how do we get into that fire so but i'm i'm getting ahead of myself but i i think the the, the there is this limited um, part when you are trying to appeal when when a somebody who's vegan and vegetarian after a while um my mom hasn't eaten meat for 30 years she she uh doesn't really like the real meaty meat alternatives, for example. Um, my, you know, so I, I've got friends though that like who who would go to a burger joint. We've got a, um, Hudson's, for example, in, 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 in Cape Town, and there's a few in Joburg that have got a really good vegan menu, or they have the Beyond Burger, and they will just take the like the normal patty, the beef patty, and swap it out, and then everything else is bacon, cheese, the whole thing except with a veggie patty. So it's like, it's, it is, very you know, it's, it's a, it's a vegan burger, except for the bacon. Um, so there's, you know, there's, it's very difficult to try and understand like how, to, what people are motivated by. I think, I think there's probably um, amongst your general consumer, um, which we've done a little bit of research on this, that re demographic, you know, representative samples would still say something along the lines of they need to eat healthier. They need to, um, uh, you know, think about the environment and, and eating slightly different when it comes to protein as part of that journey. So I think there is definitely that. And I think so that is like the nudge factor that will the behavior that we're looking um, uh, to, to not change, but to sort of work with. So but people yeah. that are reluctant vegetarians who are doing mm. it for ethical or environmental reasons, not just because of a taste preference. Yeah. And that's the demographic that you want to tap into. Because I think that mm. we, it is important to distinguish that, right? Because some yeah. people don't eat meat because they simply don't like it. There's no, mm. there's no sort of ethical question that comes into it. I mean, we all have things that we like and don't like. I dislike bananas. I don't need any ethical reasons not to eat them. You don't need a, you don't need a replacement banana. <laughs> no, one needs to no one needs to make me a faux banana in order to get yeah. me to stop eating bananas. That's a yeah. silly example but 
the more important questions that are coming about, particularly from a policy and from a political perspective, are the ethical and the environmental reasons. And again, I want to separate those two out for not eating so much meat. The ethical reasons are, I think, a, a reason why a lot of people become vegans and vegetarians or stop eating meat is because they simply don't want to be part of the horrific supply chain that involves huge amount of suffering of animals, right? So there's a reason why people that might really enjoy eating meat stop eating meat because because they don't want to be part of perpetuating a system of suffering. And they are definitely horrific stories across the agricultural supply chain, which we don't need to get into. We don't want to scare people off from listening to the rest of this conversation. Mm -hmm. But they're people that would therefore appreciate a product that enabled them to, as we said earlier, have their cow and eat it too, you know, so to eat guilt-free meat. Mm -hmm. But then there's the third layer, which is the environmental issues which are coming on board, where people are feeling pressured to stop eating meat against their will, let alone mm -hmm. against their cravings, but against their actual ability to say no. And we're starting to see these sort of resistance to allowing people to eat meat. The conversations around countries should ban their populations, hypothetically speaking, from consuming animal products because of their carbon footprints, for example. So it becomes more of an economic policy question where policymakers are looking at ways to prevent populations and citizens from eating at all, whether they want to or like to or not which is why alternatives are becoming something that we have to start considering, whether it is for environmental, ethical, or personal preference reasons. Yeah, I, look, I think, um, I mean, on the eth uh, to move quickly on to the, past the ethics thing, because I think that is a full on, um, there's much people that can have that conversation besides me. I think the interesting thing is that people that do cut back or will go vegan or vegetarian or however you describe it, for animal reasons tend to be a bit more robust and they continue with it. When you cut back for health reasons or environmental, it's like it is a bit of a sliding scale. So you could be like, mm. well, I'm going to do meat free Mondays or I'm going to be cut, or, um, you know, I'm going to cut back. I'm not going to eat meat during the week or some of those lines for health or environmental reasons, which I think any reasons for going in that direction is, is, is helpful. Um, so that's like, so, but when, you know, when people decide to go for an animal point, it's, it is generally like an animal rights aspect and then it is very much like a black or white, you're either in it or you're against it. So I think that's where you see those people that are very, um, open and strong, like those typical people, of, like the, you would say vegans on the internet that, that, that give everybody, uh, activists. Yeah, let's, yeah, activists. And, and I've worked, you know, in that space for you know, 10, 15 years. And I, I understand the reasons why you could be so passionate about something. Uh, I just think that, you know, when you've, you, when you try and look at it for solutions, then I think you just kind of go for that more than what, what feels right. And I, I think the, the, what it's resulted in is what we're seeing in this policy discussion. Um, um, when it comes to the environment, so I think often government looks at things and then it's it's they like they have this very binary look and it's like a policy, so it's on and off. So it's difficult to like play with the gray. And um, I like for example, like the Europeans are very much talking on one side of the fence, say like you've, you know they want to you know they just want to ban and tax and everything our meat and and then the other they they support agriculture incredibly. Then they they also very strict on like labeling when it comes to but you, can you call it cheese or do you have to call it cultured probiotics or can you call it milk or does it have to be drink? Or, so it's, it's government seems to be very, um, and, and I think it makes sense when you've got governments with different incentives and different within a government, there's different incentives to how to, how to manage, um, manage something. Um, and then it's also coming from people that are saying it needs to be a tax or it needs to be something like, um, we've actually written, um, uh, we've, We've written some, done some work on this, on on whether or not a tax on meat would be a good idea, um, to to limit consumption, um, with my uh, non-profit credence, and um, it's a, uh, you know, I'm I think it's up for debate, and I think it's a lot of people, particularly on those who are wanting to see change for for good reasons, to say cut back on meat. It's, I I don't think it's the most powerful solution that we have at our disposal, and I think when people feel like they're being imposed upon, I mean like. South Africa, when people get booze taken away from cigarettes, they still find their way around it. Um, and that's the same thing that I think when it comes to meat, and I think it'll be even more pushback. And we want to be able to provide a, it's not an alternative, it is meat. 
and it's and it's it's a long-term solution that can tick the boxes of animal welfare, can tick the boxes of environment, and ultimately will be able to be produced in a in a far more cost-effective and, and innovative manner. So, I think that's how you achieve longer um, uh, a longer change in behavior, opposed to trying to force attitudes to change immediately. Yeah, generally, if you can give people a benefit reason to start using a different product or to adopt a new set of behavior, it's better than using coercion or punishments or, mm. or faux rewards, which all tend to sort of diminish over time, the more those policies mm. are used and abused. And then there's also the question of the ethics of not allowing people to choose products that could you know, feasibly be actually good for their health. I know a lot mm. of people don't eat meat for health reasons, but a lot of people that don't eat meat for ethical reasons still almost require some of those proteins in order to remain healthy. It depends on your sort of mm. blood type and where you've been. I mean, I know that's, I'm not a doctor, I'm not going into that, but there's, there's people that, that could benefit from having a rich source of protein and that might, might want to, to do that for health reasons, even if ethically they're quite appalled at the idea. Mm. So having the actual thing as an alternative without compromising on your ethics is, of course, I think, a generally good thing for the world itself. Mm. So let's talk about the health question, because that mm. is the one that I didn't pick up on when I talked about preference and I talked about environmental reasons and ethical reasons. The health questions when it comes to eating meat products can, as I said, kind of go either way, depending on what doctor you talk to, what nutritionalist you get involved with or what blogs you've been reading. Mm. I am mm. absolutely not anyone that works anywhere close to the, to the health space. But let's talk about the health of meat products when it comes to cellular agriculture, because this is when mm. people start to get very concerned about the ethics of your business. And we didn't actually describe cellular agriculture, which is basically like growing meat cells in a lab. So it's real yeah. meat, it's grown in a lab, but there are no sort of no animal had to sacrifice its life in order for you to eat your meatball or your piece of bacon or your steak. It is grown humanely in that respect. Mm. No conscious creature was harmed in the making thereof. But what about the health of the people that are actually consuming this product. Many people have turned away from meat products for reasons that have come out from health boards across the world saying that certain types of meats do are correlated with chances of getting cancer further down the line or with cholesterol, or with heart problems or whatever sort of health issues there are. And then there's also the questions, of course, around genetically modified food, which gets people very, very frightened and very, very concerned. I mean, we've seen how afraid people are of even taking vaccines for COVID. And as soon as you start mentioning things like genetic engineering and cellular grown things, of course, people are frightened because they don't understand what's going into it. Can you speak with a bit more authority around the health queries, concerns, questions that have come across your table and how you are addressing them in your work? Yeah, I think maybe maybe I can just start with a brief, um, I probably should have done this at the beginning, um, overview of exactly our process. Uh, I think Please that will probably, you know, uh, just to kind of, uh, there's some, some great materials online um, um, that, that can go into these, these things in detail, but in terms of uh, getting the job done here, uh, we take a... We, we take a biopsy from a donor animal uh, that's done with a, with a, with a vet and um, there's a bit of regulations and, and to ensure that that's done in the most harm, harmless way and the most controlled way possible. Just um, to interrupt there, you, you use one of the president's cows for one of yours. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, I was, I was wondering if you were going to bring that up. I, we, um, so, uh, we've it's asked... a beautiful piece of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've done food marketing for 10 years and, 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 and mm. we... That's we were always want like we want to say like how are we going to bring cultivated meat to Africa and like the, so the two ways that we're doing it outside of the conventional approach is that we we we're um, going to be working with subsistence farmers and we've already started the conversation there to get you know because we want to get nguni cattle and these uh, sort of iconic South African uh, Bosmara cattle. The flavor of the meat you get in a South African supermarket, which doesn't taste like the rubbish American meat that you get exactly. anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. So we you know, and, <laughs> just and, and, to be hugely <laughs> controversial. <laughs> New South Africa does have, I mean, that's a thing is what we definitely do have very good quality meat for the price that we pay compared to the rest of the world. However, internally, when you look at the country, it's not everybody that can afford it. So for, for when you, as soon as you leave Woolies and, and the Checkers and Seapoint and, and Cape Town and you move into sort of other section, sections of the other suburbs, it's it, it goes to lower grade meats. And, you know, as you go rural, it becomes even more so. And then, and then people are doing a lot of backyard slaughter. So, um... But I digress. Uh, so we definitely want to be working with 
um, other interesting folks within the food system and bringing them into it. Because uh, one thing that um, we can, you, you might not have touched on, but it's also there's a lot of perceptions about what cultivated meat will do to jobs, to the industry. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's like the new technology that's going to you know, turn, turn everything on its head and get rid of it, all, you know, all the jobs. And a similar argument can be made across every single new technology. Any technology. Every, <laughs> and we've heard it all before, but we've still got to acknowledge that those concerns and, and we are working with it. And that's some of one of the motivations behind being, we're actually working pretty actively with the meat industry uh, across, across the board, uh, to be honest. Um, and, um, and, and then the, the approaching uh, Cyril was just because, I mean, he, he's got this Ankole uh, herd of cattle that are world, I mean, they're phenomenal. And um, they're famous. We like, They've made many Zapiro cartoon front yes. page covers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know there was on Zapiro. Okay, cool. That's good. Um, so, and, and we wanted to say, like, look, you know, if some some countries have been, um, like, governments have been pushed back on cellular agriculture, and we were like, well, let's go to the president and ask for his, I mean, if he's got literal skin in the game, uh, and, and then he's going to be feeding his people. <laughs> with his cows that are still worth the 2.7 million rand or whatever they were when they went on auction. We thought it was like just, and, and um, you know, it, the bit of the, the unrest that we had recently kind of pushed back obviously on some of these plans, but we've had very positive feedback from his circles um, within the space and we, we, we definitely want to still do it. Um, so yeah, watch the space and hopefully one day a, a, a Cyril uh, and Cole burger will be available to, to the market. But I am um, so yeah so a process we take that biopsy <laughs> I got I got distracted we got distracted quite a bit it's a beautiful story <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay. um yeah I, it was it was incredible it was incredible and like just to say that somebody actually within a space said okay this doesn't sound like too bad of idea I was like okay that's good enough we'll start that uh, and so you take and, the cells oh yes take the cells thank you for bringing me back Let's get back on track uh, <laughs> back, we take the cells we bring it into us we work we've got a, um, a lab a lab in Woodstock uh, in Cape Town, and um, we process and isolate the cells there. And it's uh, you know, you take five to ten, you get, you get it down to five to ten thousand cells, which is a very small amount. And it's like yeah, and then we're at the moment we, I mean, we're a startup, so we're still in a in, in a pretty young uh, young space. And what we're doing um, is at a, what we would say a bench scale and prototype or to pilot production scale, um, and we then put that those cells in a media. Um, that they um, that they're used to and they're, that they're comfortable with, and what all we're trying to do is replicate what's going on, Bronwyn, and your and like not just your body, but in everybody's body. Um, and the so what we use is, is something called an incubator, and it's it does it keeps the cells at thirty seven degrees, which is what your cells want and what my cells want. And when they are in that space and they're being fed the right um, uh, it's amino acids, uh, salt, fat, uh, fats, or co-culture with fats. They proliferate and they start growing, and they, it's exponential. They double like every you know every day almost. And um, when it starts growing to a certain point, it's done in a in, in a sort of uh, a matrix system, so that these um, that they're growing not on a two D plane, but becoming in a three D plane, like your muscles. Um, and we attach them to uh, micro or scaffolding, which you can use a variety of different things. Um, you could you could use tissue from a, from actual muscle, but we we're going to be using mycelium mushroom, and um, and uh, and um, and then after that uh, we process that in a, in a, and then we just put it into bigger and bigger vats, which one day it will look like what a craft brewery looks like, just giant vats or big vats, a couple hundred liters that we are then growing these cells in these in in suspension and then process them. Depending on on the timing, but you know, five to seven weeks or three months. Uh, there's a, there's a we're, we're trying to get our process down right, but that's how long that whole process might take. And then, and then we add spices and make it into a burger or a burger. So that's essentially the 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 short version of the story. That's really really exciting. So you've been talking now about how the process is actually done. So you're growing, mm. you're growing completely cruelty free, but real meat. So mm. let's get back to my question around yes. the health, health concerns that people would have, because people mm. are very frightened of technology. I think that we've seen. In fact, I was speaking to Zolson on the show just before you. He was who ran for the presidency of the United States. He's from mm. the transhumanist movement, and we both agreed that 
it seems that people are very frightened of technology at the moment. We are in sort of a, an optimism around technology winter or, or drought. People are frightened. Mm. Things have moved very fast. There have been a lot of things that have moved fast and broken. And as soon as you start mentioning terms like genes or like genetic editing or mm lab grown anything people mm. get very frightened i mean even around ge genetically modified corn people are frightened of those things not necessarily not necessarily because they should be frightened but often because there's an education and knowledge gap between the consumer and the citizen and between what's actually going on in the world of science because let's be honest all the fruit all the food all the vegetables that we actually eat today have been literally genetically modified even if no lab was involved it's called mm. sort of natural selection right we select the fattest grains and we we crossbreed them in order to get a banana that's even edible even though i don't like mm. bananas we're going to go back to the banana thing there because the banana. <laughs> bananas have been very edited by human yeah. beings as much as you think it's a very natural product the bananas we have today in supermarkets are not the sort of bananas our ancient hunter-gatherer ancestors found growing in the fields. So we've always mm. been modifying and improving upon our foods. I think there is a, a lot of misconceptions about what is genetically modified and what is genetically harmful or beneficial to human beings. So can you talk to the point around explaining what some of the more legitimate concerns are from people that are frightened of the genetically modified foods and what they will do to their bodies and health going forward and also some of the ways that you can answer that in your in mm. your current marketing or using science and studies that that you have developed in developing your product yeah i think um there's a, there's a couple of uh, points to 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 speak to the um i mean the one component is the fact that um large parts of south africa and africa obviously there's a lot of people that are not getting enough nutrition so i think your point earlier which you said that meat and, and animal products do probably play a role with uh, a lot of people getting more nutrition into their diets compared to um, being able to get quinoa and eating soil. only empty carbs yeah, for example. yeah exactly yeah so <laughs> exactly so so i think that that i think that's something that is definitely that i wouldn't um, push back or argue on and you know i think we we definitely believe that um uh, cellular agriculture can play a role in, in fulfilling that nu nutrient you know gap or protein gap that's a, it's available mm. I mean, I know vegetarians who, who were committed vegetarians for ethical reasons who mm. are reluctantly eating small portions of meat a couple of times mm. a year because their doctors have told them to. Yeah. Not, not because they want to, <laughs> because mm. they have been sort of forced to by concerned friends and family members. Now, maybe there are yeah. alternatives, but I th mm. I'm just speaking anecdotally there. Yeah, yeah. I think, I look, I think, well, firstly, like, again, um, that's why I like, you know, what we're doing it because it kind of moves beyond that conversation and that mm, argument. There's just no, like... Um, uh, but then it brings up more of the questions that you were raising at the second part, like how are people going to perceive it, that it's came from um, a lab or it's came from something that it's just new. And it's, it's, In a climate it of such distrust around yeah, yeah. science, trust the yeah. science has never had a worse year. <laughs> yeah, we do the experts. <laughs> You know, it's just yeah. like those PhDs that come up and say something and it's like, no, I read a, a blog on something <laughs> online and now, now that's my viewpoints. Um, so, we, you know, and, and I also had this from working in food for 10 years that people um they go and see an e-number and they just say like okay um that's you know and it maybe it's derived from like sugar or something or cane sugar or even something even like like turmeric or and, it, and they just that's it they're like no e-number it's bad and and i think that's a lot of people's perceptions that um has been pushed back of this new movement of like locally sourced organic and all this type of thing that says like everything has to be um from your backyard which is which is limited i think in ability to get everybody um everybody that yeah yeah exactly food like security get, is a big issue coming forward you, you do that you do that a while and then there's just one shock to the system and then what you know and i, and I think um yeah the food system had a, a tough time of the last 18 months with trying to um you know service a, a post-covid economy or whatever you call it and, and we we felt it and but and but I, I still think it's a bit more robust than other solutions at the moment but that's maybe another the the, the point going to so there's maybe like to to, to, to distill it to this the fact about the process that we're doing it being like highly scientific that might scare people away and then the fact about the actual product itself that it, is it healthy mm. um the 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 one point is that with the research that we've done within south africans to date it's, it suggests that um, um south africans are once explained what what we're up to they're they're pretty comfortable with it and the consumer perception in South Africa seems to be pretty good 
compared to other developed countries. And this is kind of um, now you're seeing it in China and in India, South Africa, Brazil, I think it's Brazil, versus the, the Europeans and the North Americans who are more skeptical of this new science, which I, which I thought was quite interesting. It's a bit um, counterintuitive. Yeah, you know, you would think, and, and, and maybe this whole point of like people are becoming too informed from too many sources and just not knowing what to do. Um, you know, so I think, and also when it comes down to choices, we've, we've had um, very good discussions with people in countries uh, who are doing projects in countries like Malawi, when they're looking at, I think it's black fly larvae as a protein source for people to eat. And that's being something that they're like, we want to eat it because it's, you know, we need protein at the moment. They don't, they don't have an access to, um, they don't have an access to enough. So again, um, something like, um, I'm not comparing us to insects. But um, I'm saying that it's a new type of technology when it comes to food, that people with limited choices who need protein are probably more likely to want to accept it and take it on. So I think that's what we've seen um, in terms of the research that we've done also in South Africa. Now, when it comes to um, the viewpoints on what, um, you know, we're not a, it's in, with GMOs and all these types of things, I think, um, look, I think South Africans... Um, for the most part, are pretty skeptical when it comes to this, and they think, like, particularly with their meat. Um, I think by the stage that we get to scale, when we, the, 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 the process what we're doing now, which is very much lab intensive, is not going to be the process going forward. It's like, um, you, we will once, we will only be working eventually in an actual food factory, um, and as what, or a brewery looking type thing. And I think once we've reached that stage, and that's the way that we make our food, I think the, a lot of those negative perceptions could potentially come down and big difference is that we will be like, we will have glass walls um, and, and let people come and view what we're doing uh, opposed to the current system. So I think those are the, the I think that's going to be a key sort of um, symbolic gesture to showcase that we're not, we, we're, we're doing stuff that's highly technical, but we, we want to be, um, we want to be pretty open and transparent about it. Um, I think it's, it, it'll be, it remains to be seen when it comes to, when we become more mainstream about how people view us if they view us in that who do like um science or or on something that's you know that's something that they can get from um uh, from the market down the road um and that's where we want to be kind of kind of definitely playing um so i think that's that is that remains to be seen and then finally when it comes to health uh, like the actual product itself uh you know when somebody asked me the same question on a podcast about a week or two ago and um it is neat so it, it's we we are taking what um, what is available and we make and we replicating without the need to to kill an animal. Ultimately, there will be ways to work within um, within the R and D to maybe isolate components of the meat that are more nutritious or less favorable, um, and to bring those through opposed to some of the stuff that isn't. So I think that's that is um, a, that is that is a definite possibility. The the. The one thing is that we haven't been able to do, no one has been able to do enough study on enough people eating it because... Um, For a long time, Singa yeah. <laughs> it's a long, it's, it's just, Singapore was the first country in December to actually allow this to be sold. So so now, you know, it's, it is, it will require, you know, if we really want to get some deep insight into it, I think that's going to take a bit of time. But, you know, from, from the way I like looking at it, that there's an ability to have, to isolate things, so you don't have to use antibiotics. You don't, there's, there are a lot of things that we can do already that we know would, be uh, better for an end product um, and then ultimately once we um, you know once it's coming closer to a market stage I think um, and it, it looks it looks like something that people it looks like a brewery it's accepted I think we'll be uh, we won't be seeing those GMO fears potentially okay so let's let's interrogate yeah. that point just a little bit further because you did mention that I think Singapore was the first one to legalize yeah. this I think Israel's done the same thing quite recently mm. where in the world is this legalized and who is it being legalized by so what bodies does it go through to get approved for human consumption yeah. because that will also help to you know like mitigate some of the fears that people might have around this is it regulated mm. can anyone do this can you buy sort of a crispr kit off off the internet and make your own cellular grown stuff in your garage you know like how regulated is this space <laughs> what laws exist and what laws don't exist that perhaps possibly should yeah i think um uh firstly there's there's a few countries in the world that have um are, are far more progressive on this space so the netherlands <clears throat> singapore at Israel are sort of the, the three leaders in the world. 
when it comes to what bodies are, there's, there are different organizations that are pushing forward and trying to promote um, the um, uh, allowing policymakers to, to approve um, cellular agriculture. So Good Food Institute, which is a U.S. based um, organization, but has um, or, uh, branches all over the world is, is one of the biggest around the world um, that is actually promoting cellular agriculture. They definitely played a massive role in our in our growth. Uh, we started like March 2020, so just over a year ago, um, and they were very very helpful in getting us the right conversations with with different people to to start us up. So that's in terms of that nonprofit side. <clears throat> when, it, when some countries. Um, like the US, the US have got the USDA and FDA, and they regulate food. It's it's a bit more of a tricky system because you have to get approval by them before you can sell. Um, Europeans have this um, European Council for Novel Foods or something along those lines. And again, if if you are doing something like um, they they have well, let's, let's not say GMOs, but if you're doing something that isn't seen within the normal space as food, like what we're used to, you'll have to get approval from them. And then Singapore is is another group that have or a country where they've got this novel um, uh, company, well, this not this novel policymaker of government that you have to get approval from, which results in quite a lot of bureaucracy, as you can imagine, um, to to get it uh, across. And I, I was just thinking, like, it's funny how people are, sometimes seem to trust regulators more than scientists. I don't know, just in this this reign of they conversation. They do. They do. Yeah, which is yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, that's um, that's a that's another. Well, whether point. that's right or wrong is a is a huge debate for a different day. Yeah. But, but that's why I brought it up because I think yeah. for a lot of people they wait for like with vaccines mm. they wait for the FDA full approval. They're like, I'm not going to get my shot until the FDA says so. Mm. Which is which is sort of secondary. It's it's a strange sort of logic. But everyone is looking for for security, and I think it, it, yeah. if things are new or if things yeah. are frightening, you want as much security as possible. And mm. for many people, the government is still a source of trust, even though. So yeah. many other people listening to this would find that that comment hilarious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like for a lot of people, it's the only thing we've got to trust. You know? I know. It's just so, so, sorry. I as I was it's talking, it's worthwhile it. bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, I, I'm, yeah, I, I'd, um, I'd encourage people. Yeah. Anyway, but um, this is not a soapbox. And um, so, so yeah. So it's it's it really is um, a case in in some places, the states, for example, it took forever. I mean, they just were not able. You They're know, not the selling FD, anything there now at the moment. Right? They, they, depending approval, will be on sale at the end of the year. So okay, and in uh, South Africa, what are the bodies that you that you have to work through here that you are currently yeah. working with? I mean, you're obviously the pioneer there, but someone mm. had to start it, you know. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um. I, I just want to give you a quick anecdote. Like the um, we were told when we first started this is like you just have to get your policy right. Um, this is from investors and from just everybody within the space but who weren't from South Africa or actually weren't from emerging markets because I think what we're realizing is it is different. And, um, you know, the FDA and the USDA, I think the longest time has been spoken about what to actually call it. So they were like, is it cultivated? Is it cell-based? Or is it cell, cell-cultured cell meat? That was like a long discussion that they had to get right before they could move to the next. So, I mean, that's the kind of level that you do have to deal with. So I think there's a lot of people... Um, in your in in your audience, you would be you know less governmentally inclined, would see that like this innovation is there's so many ways that government does reduce innovation. Anyway, um, we we've um, we started this conversation off early because we knew we you know we had just assumed in South Africa it was going to be quite a challenge. There is early adopters of we, regulation in South Africa we, for a developing market. We're very mm, developed in terms yeah. of. Any piece of red tape, we're happy to take the first the first strip, eh? And it depends. Like, the, like I think it's something like sorry, this is a hooter, but it's like I think it's a, if Argentina do it, we'll do it immediately. Um, there's just like there's certain countries that we just follow suit, like like instinctively. When it uh, when it comes to food, um, it is more grey. There's just a lot of like who actually is doing what. Um, there uh, there are three bodies that regulate our food. It's the Department of Agriculture and now it's whatever it is now with other other letters. Um, and the Department of Trade and Industry and the Department of Health. And then there's a bunch of regulation and acts around those three um, bodies that then define what we eat and how we eat and who can um, and how we can bring things to market. And um, so there isn't like this clear like on and off switch that you you go to this, you go to the FDA, you get this approval you, and then you move on. Um, so we've had to done a, do a bit of like um, digging around and trying to understand the, 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 the frameworks that exist 
So for example, the South African, um, and I really, uh, I, I get into regulation discussions, so you must pause me if it gets a bit boring. But no, the, no, the this South is why we have the show. It's to get yeah. people clued up on what's, yeah. what policy yeah. and regulation is going to be coming into their space well, so that people have the like, knowledge <laughs> to get involved with the conversation. Yeah, I, th- I've, I mean, yeah, we, we got into the small print and of the uh, South African Meat Safety Act. And so that is where we thought we would be, have to be playing. And, uh, you know, immediately it just says, Meat is uh, from the carcass of a dead animal. That's the definition according to that act. So we can't, we can't, we don't. Re- we, the animals that we use, um, or that we're working with, are, are going to be don't animals that carry on with their day. Um, so we have to go. With this. So there's a number of different, like there's the food stuffs, uh, cosmetics, and something act. There's there's a bunch that apply to different places, and it it it, can, it almost depends on where you are along the line. So if you, um, when it comes to labeling, it's the Department of Trade and Industry. And that's where you see um, the the honey guys going after after anyone that's making things that aren't honey and um, and, and nailing them there. The rooibos um, guys going anyone after that's not rooibos the champagne. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, I think <laughs> probably the, yeah, the it's it's so so the pepper Jew, I think he, they also were pretty big. Yes. And like, uh, but it's so funny to see like, and I think now it's there's some issue with uh, a butter that's been made. That's plant based. So they're like they they definitely pick and choose areas which they go after as like like I'm gonna. It's bring whether the, the product is trademarked or the mm. or the plant or the whatever whatever it is. Yeah, where the what trademark it, lies. It's, it's yeah, and and we it's there's a lot of where areas that where they where they do take you on and and you know we um we thought maybe that like um within uh, the red meat industry might be this but to be honest they've had they've had, They've been almost sort of not welcoming, but they've just been like, okay, these guys are doing stuff. They don't have to really worry about them. Um, so I think it depends on you know the sort of other influence, sort of, you know, the other groups or um, spheres of influence. And if they think that you're a threat, then they would probably move towards regulation and try to slow your process. Regulation so, is ultimately coronation, isn't it? Yeah. Right. The whole point yeah. of regulation is to be on one side of the line that everyone else mm. is on the other side. I think people also have a, a skewed perspective of what regulation really does. What regulation really does is it protects the incumbents, right? <laughs> it creates a competitive mode. It keeps keep some people out and some yeah. people in, much like unions, right? I mean, yeah. this is, this is yeah. literally how they function. So yeah. They, yeah. they're not only designed to protect the consumer, they're also very often designed to co- to protect the industry. So it's in mm. your interest. I mean, let's just be honest. Let's like just talk about the, the elephant or the cow in the room. Mm. But it's in your own interest to develop regulation that protects you as the, the market leader in the space. So mm. <laughs> as much as there's good reasons to have regulation to come to protect the end consumer, too. Yeah, I think it's it's been a very I mean, like you, you always learn about um, how how industry it's and it's and it's just what it, what it, sportsmanship or what is the, the the gamesmanship it just it's part of the what you have to do and if you don't do it somebody else was i i remember um once previous company they were working for like the the it was in Shoprite i think and um uh, i wasn't working for Shoprite, but we were, were our product was being sold there and a new bunch of folks came in and they just didn't they didn't bring they had like the nutritionals were all wrong they were like they clearly hadn't done um it, yeah, it was it was in, in, incorrectly labeled a whole bunch of stuff, and you just you don't even need to go to government. You just need to go to the the retail and say like, look, um, this is, and that that whole product line had to be taken off. So, I think there's definitely component, and, and I think you could argue in favor of either side to say like, um, why uh, this one, you, why you need to protect the consumer versus why you need to allow um, for people to make their own choices and in, in, in on shelf, but. Um, I do think that some that industry is able to kind of use it against new innovation through like the guise of protecting the consumer and I don't think it ultimately it helps so um, so I think you know the regulations in South Africa are slightly um, we we're very much encouraged by it I think like we, we we're not um, we're not jumping for joy but we're definitely saying that um, we're gonna we're gonna be bringing this to market as soon as possible and regulations is going to be a con factor, but it's not going to it's not going to be the factor that like slowed down the growth in like this in America, for example. Um, and it's just about finding the existing framework um, that we can potentially work through. Um, and, and perhaps uh, getting involved with writing regulation for the space, which, as I mentioned, could could. <laughs> but that's could another. That's favor. yeah. But that's a very <laughs> long. That's I mean that's a long long headache process. So I mean I think you know I think it definitely in, in the future that. You, 
that will happen. Um, but I think we'll you need a team and, and patience, I think, to get that. And if you look at some of the acts that have been passed, they've been in draft for three, five years, and um, and that's and people just say, okay, that's good enough. We'll, we'll just let that go. So, yeah, I, I, I'd I think be... Yeah. general South Africans are more concerned about things like property rights and mm, mm. basic income grants. So these sorts of conversations tend to happen on the fringes. They're not even as mainstream as conversations around the future of cryptocurrency regulation, which is also a new emerging mm. space where the regulation doesn't fit with what is going on. But there's more eyes on those sort of problems and very, very few eyes on your space at this point mm. in time. Yeah, I think I think it's it is something that's down the line. I mean, we um, I think as an industry, certainly the agriculture is 2016. I think it, uh, there were four companies doing it in the world. Um, in 2013, it was the first burger ever made. So and that was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something to make one burger. Price points dropped down quite a bit now. Um, trust me. And they only um, started being sold last year, right? I mean, the, the only and the first the first sale ever was in. Um, in Singapore um, uh, by a company from America called Just, and they had a company called Good Meats because they couldn't even sell in America. So they, they that's why they went to Singapore and the, the, and because they knew the regulation um, framework was a bit more friendly. Um, and that's, that, I mean, they managed to raise a bunch of money after that and then go um, uh, and now go into scale of production. And, um, but in, in that space of time, now we're looking at about 75 companies, maybe about 120 depending, um, all across the the value chain of solar agriculture. So um, uh, a portion of those are your consumer facing like us, we're trying to make a burger, a sausage or a chicken. Um, others are just focusing on on the growth media, on the bioreactors that we get, the, the vats that we will be using to actually grow the cells. So I think you're, you're seeing an industry that's gone from, you know, one cell to like many and, and now it's starting to like formulate itself and understand that part of that journey will be formalizing the regulations across the world. Um, but each country will have its own set of rules. Um, but I think as people sort of find arbitrage that they can say, okay, that area, it's probably, you know, there's not many companies in South America, for example, that I know of. You know, maybe there's a bunch of people that are going to start up there. Then the regulations will sort of follow suit. It's like it's it's like a one st you know the chicken and the or chicken and the egg in terms of when the regulations come or versus when the companies come. And I think that's what we're seeing now. And it's we're in that sort of the second or third ish wave of where we're at as as an industry. And I think in the next wave we're going to be there's going to be five to ten companies based in South Africa, um, and there's going to be ones working on more isolated components of the production instead of saying we've got to grow the whole thing the whole chicken or whatever it is so um and then again the regulation will just follow that and um, it's not going to be it's not going to be the other way around good point but there was one other thing that i wanted mm. to get into in terms of the close to the regulation space because mm. in preparing for this interview i was reading up on some of the more shall we say creative criticisms of your industry mm. and one of the interesting criticisms that i came across came out of i think europe and again as we say we're finding a lot of anti tech progressivism mm. in the, that part of the world a lot of regulations seeing technology as an enemy rather than seeing it as a, a support for for human growth and flourishing going forward and the argument basically went that people should be concerned about the cellular meat industry because because essentially the industry is trying to copyright what was a free food source. So in other mm. words, you can't copyright a chicken. You can copyright a cell line from a particular chicken. Or in your case, you can copyright the germline of Cyril's cows. And then suddenly the food group that we were able to eat, consume, grow and have for ourselves freely as individuals becomes a regulated, copyrighted product. And just to sort of illustrate this concept a bit more, in a previous life I was involved with marketing supplements and of course we dealt with all the regulations across the world as we got into export and all the rest of it and one of the challenges of the natural health industry was the fact that pharmaceutical companies started regulating any natural component that worked so one of the big dramas around the sort of Health Practitioners Association in South Africa was around the plant St. John's wort, which worked to give alleviate a lot of suffering. A lot of people took it. It was just a plant that you grew in your garden. And as soon as it started being proved to work, it was regulated by the pharmaceutical companies and then you could no longer put it into a supplement. So in other words, the, the unregulated space again, the people outside of the moat were suddenly unable to access 
what was previously a natural abundant source of whatever that source was, whether it was a source of healing or a source of food, as soon as it becomes regulated, it becomes more expensive, it becomes something that can be copyrighted and can be wrapped up in red tape and protected at the at the expense of the little guy in order to preference the big company. So the mm. argument goes that by allowing cellular agriculture to take place, the companies behind it, such as yourself, the big bad capitalists, if you want to put it that way, are mm. essentially trying to copyright what was a, a natural source of food and make it less accessible to ordinary consumers. Now, mm. I, I, I am presenting this argument merely because I thought it was interesting, not because I agree with it per se, but I thought it was worth addressing with you, how coming at the ethics of the meat industry from a very different perspective, other than the sort of suffering of human beings, drawing that inequality question in, which is of course the other side mm. of donut economics, which is framing almost every conversation we have about any industry right now. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? First, I just think it's a very, um... It's a very interesting uh, line of line of discussion. I um, I always it's I always find it funny. Um, well, I find it funny that eventually the two people who have the biggest targets on our back are probably going to. I mean, as I said, maybe not the meat industry, but from from my viewpoint, it's going to be the big, big quote unquote bad meat industry. Um, and ultimately, it'll be like the sort of quite progressive regenerative far like the, that sort of. The degrowth, the, the, the degrowth, yeah, the guys, degrowth. Right? like the, you know, going going so far away from um, <laughs> how people live. You know, you know, they don't they don't accept that people actually, for the most part, do want to get in a bus and play on their smartphone to their job that they work for eight hours to six hours a day um, these days. Anyway, so I think four it's, now, it's right? Like, so we just yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for a week. Um, so it, it's like this. It's this convergence of like. Um, uh, of two, you know, I call these... it mo Miba strip uh, politics, yeah, right? The further, the further you walk, <laughs> like, you how are they, <laughs> they, they're, they're friends now. And, and it's, it was always interesting when um, I've worked with in a, in a, in a wide space, so like very on the, you know, just working in retail and like very capitalist type mindset, and then working with a lot of nonprofit space for that same amount of time, and getting to see both and, and seeing um, how things like GMOs have been sort of taken on by a certain group and then almost weaponized, not from their, their actually causing harm, but the perception, and then that resulting in people not getting access to in, in areas which they probably need it. And the same thing could be said about things like pesticides, and, and that's another whole discussion, but I think it's a similar it's a similar conversation that's been had. It's an, it's an anti... It's an anti capitalist free market conversation basically yeah. i don't know free market's probably the wrong word it's a, it's an mm -hmm. anti-business perspective yeah. as opposed to an anti-product yeah. perspective yeah. and uh, it's it, i mean and it's yeah so it's it's interesting and like um i always liked it i think um like enterprise versus like corporates and i think that's what you want you want to be more on the enterprise thing and less on the corporates and when you're doing stuff even if you are if you are a progressive environmental organization that's starting to benefit corporates it's probably you then you're like oh wait you've got to go back again and also knowing that like having these regulations the people that speak the most to regulators and policymakers are not the consumer it's the businesses so the more difficult and the complicated that you think you might be doing well by your constituents the easier it is for only a select group of people to understand it properly the lawyers or the firms and then those are the ones that really are the ones that get to um to to Exploit them. It's like tax law, right? That's, yeah. why, that's why rich people don't pay tax because they're the only yeah. ones that can afford the lawyers that can find the loopholes. I mean, is that why Bezos went? Of... <laughs> yeah. He went up. To, uh, he went to go and sort of throw out his returns. He went up in space. To, yeah. Um, but so you know, so tax I am. Um, deductible. <laughs> that whole anyway. That was that was that was it's unique. An aside, but, but it's part of the same point. Mm, it, so, I so, think it is. It does mm. speak to to. So, so what I think the that's criticism what, really is. Which is which is fine, and I and I and I and I'm and I'm we, I think we're ready for. And I think, you know, as an industry, like people are kind of working. I mean, we want to be working across the line. And I think that's why we're doing the way we're approaching it. We're speaking to, I mean, in the last month, I've spoken to folks that, well, we have spoken to folks that work at slaughterhouses, that work as breeders, that work as cattle farmers, as subsistence farmers, as, you know, vets, etc. So we, we, we definitely are wanting to understand the sort of existing and not be like, Let's just completely throw it out. Um, that, that, but I do want to get back to that question because I think it's um, so. So I think if, if I can understand it correctly, is to say that like we will eventually become the industry will become a 
a sort of conglomerate. Vertically blockchain. integrated and yeah. anti-competitive. Yeah, yeah. In exactly. other words, that you won't be able to even buy a naturally yeah. slaughtered chicken yeah. or a naturally slaughtered mm. naturally. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. or a current a current steak in the shop, you would only mm. be able to buy the copyrighted yeah. product that is controlled by a limited amount of what is hypothetically going to be these mm. big monopoly companies that don't even exist mm. yet because let's just yeah. put a bit of perspective on there as you've mentioned there's this is only legal in two very very tiny markets yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the startup industry but like yeah. it's 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 the it's the the criticism that people have seen technology go from very small mm. to huge monopoly it's what's happened in the platformification as i like mm. to say of what's happened with our digital world where yeah. it has gone from being a free internet that was about democratizing access and opportunity and ownership in the early 2000s to being a, a horribly monopolistic market that we have now where a couple of very mm. very big tech platforms control access to pretty much all of our information so i think that people making these arguments are looking to the future they're not they're not stating a fact they are concerned about the same thing happening in the real world and what then what they have seen technology do to the digital space mm. so i think that's that's to frame the, the argument yeah. fairly if you want to attack it from from where it comes mm. and, and, and again let me not attack I, I think as i said i think it's a good point i think it's something um when you know when we first started this we um we wanted to like take uh eggs and put it in power aid and stick it in a microwave and see what happens you know and like Okay, well, that's not what happened. Just for the record, but, but like we were, we wanted no, to do. Don't do that, please. Don't <laughs> do, that. <laughs> do not, do not, yeah, in, with, with a tinfoil thing on it. No, um, no, no, please so, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so we like, so we definitely there's a there is definitely within this um, within the space, and I think it's within all industry. There's like a group of biohackers that are looking to try and do this in as decentralized as de like um, small scale as possible, and then um, be able to replicate that out across. Uh, environments where it makes more sense and like South Africa is a great example because we've got big cities but we've got people living in small areas and um, if you're able to get a uh, this uh, a bio a bioreactor small scale and um, pretty cheap into um, parts of rural South Africa then you, I think you've done something quite int interesting and intriguing so um, there's definitely schools of thought that would want to work towards that I think also in comparison to the existing and um, conventional industry they, I mean they there's a lot of lines within um, chicken and cows and beef and stuff that is, um, you know, you the, the, you do have to buy access to those those animals and then and then those are going into the big conventional farms and um, that that the majority of us eat. So I think it's firstly also in comparison to the existing, it's not, um, it's like saying, um, oh, we we're going to replace this uh, system with another system and then just in this new system, animals aren't being killed for it. So that's like basically the only difference. Mm. So so I think it's. Is it an improvement away from if if it was as bad as people thought it would be like like that argument? I think it still would be an improvement. Is it going to be this case that all this um, information is going to be under the lock and key forever? It can't. I don't. I think there's going to be too many people working within the space that can be able to like get this information out for free. I mean, we've seen that um, already. It's it, there are there is information available to kind of start this up, but obviously after a certain stage, you have to go and improve upon it and and make it your own. So. I, like I think, um, I think it will get to a stage where it it will be almost too difficult to try and um, uh, try and keep this under wraps. I mean, you could then just go do a biopsy on your own if you are a scientist and wanted to do it. So, um, I think they did do that. I think some yeah. some scientists in Israel did actually grow lab grown steaks grown out of their own bodies. So it was I sort could, of like I, it was. <laughs> I remember I, that case study from a couple yeah. of years back where it was like I did it was not like, know that it was humane cannibalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which <laughs> is, have I mean, or in fact they were offering the, the, yeah. the article that wrote it was 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 saying that you could get like a, a steak made from a from a celebrity's sort of mm. skin scratching. So that the celebrity would do their mouth swab, send it in, and you yeah, could have like a Marilyn Monroe sort of burger. Okay. Which is an entirely like different hammer. story, yeah. but let's not scare the but, but, let's no, not let's scare yeah, the viewers. Like, like, yeah, um, I, my team You're not doing that like, yet. Yeah, no, no. Uh, well, how did Cyril's we get here, cows, but, not Cyril uh, himself. Cyril, it's not going to be Cyril. It's Cyril's cows, and we, and also we, you know, we'll be working with them, so we can't trademark them just in case anyone's listening. Because um, that was <laughs> that whole point with with Cyril is to be able to take uh, you know a public figure and then make his his um, you know some products available to the public. Um, but I think so. I think. To the the concern is valid. I I I wonder if it's going to happen, and I think like I also think that a lot of people say that they want this completely democratized component of food, and then 
you know, everybody knows how to make bread, but there's still only a couple of people that actually go and make it on industrial scale. So I think we'll probably be able to like always be able to make our food no matter what it is. Um, uh, and you'll have a buyer act at home and you'll have a, um, a 3D printer, uh, whatever. But for the most part, you'll still go out to a restaurant and get somebody else to do it. I just think a specialization will be be the, the, the nature of the day. And I don't think it's, it's such economies a of thing. scale, right? I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how we have nice yeah. things in our, yeah. in our perhaps overly consumptive world. Mm. We still do are the beneficiaries of mm. economies of scale and of specialization of production of Adam Smith's world. We are the yeah. inheritors of it. Yeah. Whether we're comfortable with that or not, <laughs> I think we do need to be at least admit <laughs> yeah. that we benefit quite a lot from the world being structured the way it is in terms of our supply chains. Exactly, exactly. I, I think um, I think that's um, we, we're being offered solutions um, that are going to make our lives easier and make make us focus on 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 new and crazy exciting ideas. And I think that's that's the kind of I'm the I'm a bit more positive than I think most on on the future. And um, I think something like cellular agriculture offers that. It offers a component within food systems to get more people eating nutritious food, to reduce animal welfare harm, and then um, yeah, and then get people to focus on, on on doing other cool things in their in their labs because we we don't want to be doing we don't want to be in a lab the whole time. We want to move out as well. Exactly. So mm. before, I think we've covered most of the, the sort of mm. big criticisms that are facing our industry. And I think we've unpacked at least the basics of the science and introduced mm. people that were brand new to the subject to it. But as I do work as a futurist, I can't resist asking you uh, a last question about what what about actually playing a bit more with a bit more Franken foods in the labs? Mm. Do you have mm. any plans to, if not create burgers out of people, which will definitely raise a few eyebrows, but I just can't resist mentioning that because it's so, it's so out there. But are you planning on doing anything that you can't do with natural animals? Obviously, we've always tried to breed living or livestock to create better quality foods and better tastier products. And this is what humans have always done. That obviously takes a long time. You've got to do that natural, unnatural selection very, very slowly, one breeding pair at a time, one stud cow as you go down mm. the line. But what can you do in the lab that you can't do with natural animals? Exciting things like, like making bacon and lamb put together flavors into mm. one meatball instead of having to combine those ingredients or coming up with entirely new types of meat that perhaps we haven't heard of before. What can you do that we can't do even with our, our cruelty yeah. infused currency? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I um, I think um, I think we're going to be able to like speed up the process of um, of a lot of things. I think that's going to be the one the one biggest outcome of our, of our industry when it comes to protein production. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of, um, sp I say, spin-off types of industry that uh, we just, we, you know, we just didn't think that what we would do. So, for example, fat. I mean, animal fat is, you know, delicious. It, it's the why people, it's that texture, it's that mouthfeel, it's that everything that why you bite into a burger. And if we are able to create fat that is almost as pervasive as, a, as anything else, do we ever then need to go and look at something like palm oil, for example? Um, you know, so which is another <laughs> lengthy discussion. But there's, I think that there's going to be externalities of this industry, hopefully mostly positive, that creates um, new foods, components of our food Foods system. we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah. Entirely new foods. Not yeah. just replicating nature like we were speaking about yeah. right at the beginning, yeah. but actually using technology to do new things yeah and, and then to do and, old things in new ways exactly and i think that's like and, and that's what you know the plant-based side of things is about taking the it's protein and then trying to make it exist to or something existing and we're trying to find something that's got like out of thin air in a sense and um and i think the other the last spin-off um would be something along the lines within public health that there might be um, discoveries made with what we're doing that might benefit retroactively to like sports injuries or to um, injuries, back injuries or something along those lines, which we don't know yet, but, but they might happen because of the work that we're doing. I think then when it comes to the, the exciting thing is yes. I mean, we want to make steaks that taste like butter. We want to make, um, you know, 
very exotic meats potentially and there is a there is another company doing springbok um cultivated meat but maybe there could be something more interesting down the line in the future something can you um, like re re invigorate like a dodo burger for example if you mammoth want some. dodo or a mammoth you know, steak it's, yeah mm, it's i mean it's it's it is taking from like frozen to uh, uh, frozen and unfrozen is quite a tricky component because uh, but but these are the things that potentially we could do i think i also think that um what, what um, so the exotic meats I think we could you know potentially do and, and, and things that are endangered now um, it, the, there would be no need to rhino horns etc like this there would be no need to go and actually kill a rhino when you can when you can grow the exact same thing but again that comes down to like the actual perception of it coming from a from a live animal which some people even think with meat they think it needs to come from an animal that was killed so um, so I think those are the sort of exciting exhaust, exotic types that that might come from what we're doing. Um, and I and I think my future, uh, well, if I'm looking forward, is is that what what would be meat 2.0? Because I because in a sense we are still making meat. What could possibly be made? What could we focus on the the um, the different muscle muscle tissues in an animal that makes something that isn't meat that's something beyond I'll both say beyond meat, but uh, but but, yeah, but, uh, but like that is that is. That is not that is meat, but the next the next iteration, and um, and and then it's not completely. I mean, then we don't need to even maybe use animals or to what it is. It comes from somewhere else. I mean, as a, as a side note, there's a um, there is a, permit, a, a fermentation company, precision fermentation company that are using protein that have come from the volcano. It's called Nature's Find. It's in the states. I think it's backed by one of the big ones, Bezos or whoever, and. Um, and they're taking that type of protein and then turning it into products. So there's just, I think cellular agriculture just offers this, at the moment, a very, like, it's, it's, it's infinite, the possibilities that we might get. But I think, you know, we've spoken a little bit more, but it's not just about the possibilities, but it's actually about making something, a product, that somebody will buy and actually want to eat. So I think that's, it's, you can bring a rhino burger to the water, but a person's not going to eat it. If you if it's not uh, if it if it's not something that they still are used to and they want to test. Great answer. Thank you so much for being mm. so informative as to what's going on and for answering some of the, the more fair and some of the less fair questions that are directed at your industry. I want to give you the last word. So if there's anything else you want to clarify or any points that you want to make that you didn't get the chance to go for it. And then if you can also tell people where to find you, if you would like to be found by the, the few people that watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, we need to, we need to um, start growing those numbers as well. Um, uh, maybe in a lab, uh, but um, yeah, I think um, <laughs> I think from from my side, I well, you know, Mzanzi um, isn't we're a new company. Um, we've uh, as I say we started about a year ago. We've managed to get a space and uh, get a bunch of really smart people together that are excited about food systems. Um, I think the kind of um, other exciting component is me is that we were the first in Africa, and then we were able to. We just finished up an oversubscribed pre-seed round, so we've um, we've sort of trailblazing and doing some pioneer work in Africa, and, and I think a lot of South Africans are going to see a lot of innovation getting driven from here on the continent. Um, Cape Town, I think, will become a biotech hub, and we're just excited to be part of that space and driving it. In terms of um, our plans, is that we do want to be able to get our product to market as soon as possible. It takes. It's taking it, it. It takes a lot of work that to to get this right, and we're hoping that South Africans within, um, you know, by the end of uh, by the end of this year or uh, early next year, that at least some South Africans will be able to try it, and then we want to be um, uh, getting into market, into niche market, and at the end of next year. So those are our goals, and and trying to get funding and and all that with that. I think it's going to be very possible, and I'm I'm excited about um, the future. I think you can. Um, in terms of uh, finding us and checking out for more information, if you find us on LinkedIn, it's probably our most active place. Um, and um, I also at Mzanzi Meet Co on Twitter. Um, but uh, you'll get to follow us because then you'll also get to find out what uh, what Sol Ramaphosa says to our quest <laughs> or question on whether or not we can have some of his cells. His cow cells. Okay. His cow cells. <laughs> yes, just to be clear. Just to be yeah. clear. <laughs> yeah. In case anyone awesome. missed that part. <laughs> Thank mm. you so much.